Welcome to the first lecture of the third part of our class, Symmetry, Structure, and Tensor Properties and Materials. As we head toward Tensor Property Materials, we want to um, add atoms. Now this actually won't be completely necessary. When we go to Tensors, we're just going to represent a material's properties as tensors. It'll reflect the symmetry of the crystal structures because tensors are representing the three-dimensional nature of materials. But uh, before we get there, um, instead of just jumping from symmetry right to sort of tensor properties, um, we are going to take a deviation for a few lectures to show you that now that we have all these symmetry symmetries, the allowed crystal structures just from uh, you know essentially geometry uh, and other rules about filling space, that uh, there there is a a way in order to add atoms. Uh, and to um, estimate what compounds um, what compounds would have particular kinds of um, space groups. And so we're going to take a few lectures just to go over that. It's kind of cool because, again, uh, without having to really get into more formal representations of how to build up materials from... Uh, bonding and and looking at bonding electron energies will just um, you know make some assumptions. Of course, you know we'll we'll, we'll justify our our thoughts here in in a bit. Now, um, you guys may have heard of Pauling's rules, and Pauling uh, created rules actually do exactly what we're talking about. When you look at a lot of these lattices and everything else, you say, well, why why do these two elements when they form this ionic structure form this particular coordination around the atoms and therefore uh, put it into a particular space group and um, after thinking about this for a while um, he created five rules that kind of derive in a way or kind of help you estimate what the possible crystal structures might be and so we're going to start in this lecture by going over the first one. Now, the first one is where a lot of the meat is. So basically, we are going to spend a lot of time looking at words that are used uh, inside uh, this this first uh, this first rule, and we're going to have to develop uh, some some of your understanding as what those things are. And that's what we're going to spend the next uh, couple lectures on. So. Um, the first rule is a coordination polyhedron is formed about each cation. The cation anion distance is determined by the sum of their radii, and the coordination number is determined by their radius ratio. So there's a few things in each one of these sentences we need to talk about. Uh, the first one is coordination polyhedron. And that's basically just saying, we've already talked about this a little bit, that you know in the different symmetry groups we'll have a lattice point that has a particular kind of, of uh, shape to it with respect to the other nearest neighbor uh, lattice points around it. And so you could think of that uh, essentially as a polyhedron. We've mentioned that tetragonal structures uh, have um, you know, this sort of uh, unit here where I uh, have, let's see if I get this right, a situation like this where if I had a lattice point here and I have these lattice points over here that are the nearest neighbors, we would say that this is in a sort of tetrahedral pocket because its nearest neighbors, there's four of them, one, two, three, four, and it forms a little tetrahedron. So Pauling is calling this a coordination polyhedron. So even though this sits in some you know larger unit cell that goes on, he's looking at um, essentially if you look at compound like A B for example, you know there's an uh, an atom of sitting of A and there's all B around it, and that these things form you know some sort of desired uh, shape uh, due to the space group, right? So um, it's just breaking down. The, the space group further into um, uh, what could be looked at as the ultimate, uh, you know, uh, sort of shape from a, a sub-primitive a cell, right? Now, um, we're starting to use terminology cation and anion. Uh, 
that implies ionic structures, and I'm going to tell, um, describe in a minute why we're going to uh, use ionic structures to head out on our path here of adding atoms to to our spa uh, to our um, lattices, and the reason is that this simplifies things tremendously because we think about these atoms as billiard balls, and that leads, of course, into this sort of concept of atomic and um, ionic radii. And um, and that allows us to then uh, build this up in a fairly simple um, way, which we'll, we'll go over. So um, the cation, uh, if you recall, is the positively charged. So typically we we'll write A, and that would be a cation, for example, if I had a single um, electron that was given up. And if I accepted an electron in a compound like AB, uh, similarly, so this would be the cation, and this is the anion. So the anion accepts electrons, the cation uh, gives it, so cation is positive charge, anion is negative charge. So the distance they're saying is, look, uh, when this thing gives up its electron, you know, we'll have to think about this, but in a primitive bi billiard ball, it looks like this. In general, B, because it accepts electron, its electron cloud's larger. We say this is, you know, the radius of ion, of ion B. Now, this is kind of primitive structure from the way that we really know where these are electron clouds controlled by quantum mechanics, and they often have uh, kind of odd shapes to them. So we'll, or distorted shapes at least, and, and how do we get away with this? And how would we determine what uh, uh, um, is the radius anyway? Because these are usually buried inside some compounds. So how do we actually, you know, is this a really useful experimental way to, to do it? And finally, uh, we're defining a new thing called a coordination number. And that's determined by their radius ratio. So what this says is that somehow there's something called the coordination number, Cn, and that is related to the ratio of uh, the two ions. And you can see why this is kind of useful, because if this is true, then uh, these ratio of the radius of A and B determine the coordination number. The coordination number is how many of uh, how many atoms is this atom bonded to. So here this coordination number would be 4. If I called this A Cn sub A equals 4 because it's bonded to 4 other atoms in the structure. Right, and the coordination number, in other words, is extended over this coordination polyhedron. Uh, when I, you know, bond to these four, the shape that that thing takes is the polyhedron, and the, and it represents. It has to represent the the number of bonds that uh, A has, and of course, in a crystal structure, B has some number of bonds too, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the same number uh, as this one. Right, you could have different coordination, uh, and then we'll show you how the coordination, of course, of um, A and B uh, in simple binary compounds, you know, is related to the composition. Because if I have a different number of bonds over here, then the fraction of bonds going to each one is a little bit different, which means that ultimately the compound must have a different composition. So everything's tied together once you start unraveling the onion here. Because if we start off with this big assumption, and we'll have to come back to that later because we don't even know if we can measure these things or how do we know these things. But, uh, you know, this uh, ratio of the ions is the key. Um, that gives the coordination number, that leads to the coordination polyhedra, which leads to which space groups we would want because uh, the environment um, around a lattice point or an atom sitting in between lattice points, you know, that environment is determined by the symmetries that are allowed in our space group, okay? So let me deviate backwards to the beginning of what I was saying in the last view graph, which is that uh, we want this billiard ball uh, description, which we're showing here. You know, this kind of you know billiard ball setup is very attractive to us, uh, for us to, to evolve here. So the question is, how do I get there? 
A quick review of bonding uh, in materials. You typically have the energy of a bond is represented like this. If I imagine uh, the atoms being far, far away and being isolated, so you know, picture a uh, uh, a solid just completely expanding and all the atoms flying apart. And I were to track uh, two of those atoms when they get infinitely far apart, this eventually goes to zero. But by definition, as soon as they get closer, uh, by sharing electrons, you can lower the energy. And then that energy eventually, which is shown here with electron bonding. But then, you know, in the ionic world, uh, they kind of use a term nuclear repulsion for that. Obviously, as the positive nuclei get closer and closer together, ultimately there's a point where the uh, the insertion of electrons between the two atoms doesn't lower the energy overall. It starts to rise. And then, of course, if I add these two things up, I end up with some energy minimization where the bonding distance uh, is um, uh, R0. Now, uh, before we get any more details about this, I want to uh, go through how, uh, why we're discussing this. The first one is that um, this ultimately can only uh, really be thought of this way in a in a ionic sense, because this nuclear repulsion isn't quite true. If you solve the Schrodinger equation, uh, you guys might remember that as I bring uh, two atoms together for covalent bonding. There's always these two states, a bonding and antibonding state. And the bonding state is where the electron density of the uh, electrons that can interact in bonding that are not closely held, we call them valence electrons typically, uh, they put a negative charge electron cloud in here between two positive ions, let's say, and that lowers the energy of the overall system. So that's called a bond. Now, uh, it turns out that if there's always another state where the electrons are um, uh, actually, you know, located in uh, uh, far away from the center part, and that's the antibonding state, because here, with the clouds over this direction, uh, you can see sort of what uh, um, uh, they're talking about here, because um, these two uh, positive ions have very little electron shielding in front of them, so of course it would be a tendency to not want to have these things come together um, at all. Now, strictly speaking, if you just think about what's happening in between these two states, as I get closer and closer, uh, there's more and more uh, overlap, and for example, if I have two um, electron, what happens is um, I can have them lower into uh, an electronic state with spin up and spin down. But let's suppose I have um, lots of electrons and I try to bring these closer. You know, another factor in here is the Pauli exclusion principle, which is if I look at, you know, what kind of states are available, what happens is I squish these things closer and closer together. I actually have to have uh, electrons fill higher energy states because um, I can't have these levels uh, very close in when I have a huge electron density squeezed in between uh, these two ions. So yes, uh, that's all in these pictures of bonding antibonding, but it's a little bit more complicated than just saying nuclear repulsion. Now, the reason we get away with this is we'll just say, well, let's look at an ionic material, and let's say that this thing is literally left with just its tightly held, so here's a nucleus, and, you know, I have these inner uh, uh, electrons, but they're really tightly held. And uh, I had before this valence electron here, but it's completely ionic. So what I've done is I've transferred that over to my bonding partner over here. It also has maybe some very tightly held, non-interacting uh, um, electrons. And it has a complete shell now because this sort of uh, 
one was grabbed over here, and so we have a, a B minus, and this is an A plus. And because this one is left only with its tightly held blue electrons, and this one is uh, um, has the outer shell completely happy because it's absorbed this electron, both of these are, are billiard ball-like in the sense that they're their shells are tightly held and very happy. And then you could say, well, you know, these are attracted sort of in a very crude uh, billiard ball way. And that's kind of what we're showing you over here. You know, there's a positive charge minus. We just draw a hard shell and we say they're, they're attracted uh, together. And that allows us then to kind of go to this abstraction of saying, all right, Covalent one's a little more complicated. I got to think about the gradual transition between blue and red here as these guys get closer. And uh, it's complicated because electrons are shared across um, all of these uh, um, different atoms. So we're going to push that to the side and say, look, we're going to take the easy case. We're going to take the billiard ball thing where we can think of A atoms and B atoms and that's it. And that will be justified um, in this limit because I have pure electron transfer, or I, I'm assuming I have pure, pure electron transfer, and therefore I have this very simplistic model of bonding the ionic bond. Now just one other feature that um, maybe isn't that relevant for us here, although we'll talk about it a little bit because the way that we extract ionic uh, radius um, because we have to somehow uh, get real numbers eventually to figure out how you know what the real compounds would well, what space groups they would occupy and so what we do is um, uh, look at polarization and polarization is dependent on things like the forces between um, uh, atoms uh, in a solid in an ionic solid uh, we typically re represent and you might have seen this uh, in previous uh, classes you've had, we represent uh, in a solid the um, uh, bonding between uh, uh, ions uh, as sort of a spring constant. That is, if I put an electric field in here and I shake this up, uh, the force that's kind of acting on these two things looks like a spring. Now that's kind of odd. I mean, we could just take that as an engineering acceptance because, you know, we modeled that, we say it's true. To me, it's fascinating that what happens here is you take curves that essentially are coulombic uh, in nature and have, as I said in the covalent case, even other complications imposed like the Pauli exclusion principle, which is buried uh, inside the Schrodinger equation. And, and you, you actually um, you know, have this interesting uh, situation where when I when I look at total energy, I get this in-between curve that is shown here in the blue. And right down by the stable R0 where the crystal sits, because remember this R0 is for you know the bonding between all these atoms throughout the entire lattice. Uh, right down at the bottom here, if I were to zoom in here, this thing looks like a parabola. So even though the energy versus R curves are, for example, Coulombic, and in the Schrodinger equation, the uh, Coulomb potential is the key potential. It is very interesting that you end up in the small deviation around R0, you end up with E being proportional to R minus R0 squared, which is uh, shown up here. That's called the harmonic potential. It's a parabola. And that's just very interesting because it means that when I take the derivative of an energy with respect to distance, I get a force. And so that's why we say this uh, can be represented by a spring. Because it is kind of odd if you actually think about it for a bit. You say, well, I have these sort of charged um, ions inside my solid, yet I imagine that there's springs connecting them when you would think I have Coulomb potential, which follows of one over R. And so where where is all this uh, uh, spring stuff coming from? And so that's the kind of interesting uh, thing. And of course, the other relevance to just put this in the back of your head is when we go to tensor properties of materials, we're going to abstract ourselves to the higher level where uh, 
we say that stress is related to some array of constants times the strain. Well, strain is just, of course, if we call this direction x, you know, if I do delta x over x, that's the strain, right? So it's directly related to kx. And so, um, uh, you know, that's another abstraction we'll use later. And again, this kind of spring comes from the parabolic energy, which comes from the Coulombic curve plus the repulsion curve. Uh, adding together to give us this uh, deviation around R0, which happens to be parabolic. Of course, if you move far away from here, and you might notice there's a lot of, uh, in large deviations, large strains, you'll get what's called anharmonic. You'll basically, uh, this thing won't look like a perfect parabola anymore, of course, if you get too far away from R0. So, this slide should have convinced you that we can think about billiard balls in the ionic case, we know uh, what's happening. We know there's an R0. We understand that there's a spring connecting them. And that can be folded up later into tensor notation for things like stress and strain, which are important properties of materials. But for now, we're going to just think of this. The most important first step is to go back to Pauling's um, uh, first rule. And we need to now think about uh, okay, fine, if I have a complete electron transfer, um, how do I think about these, uh, these radi the radius around A and B, and, and how does that relate to the other thing he mentioned, which is coordination number? And so that's what we're going to do now. So here I'm showing you... Um, uh, how we can think about that. So here's... A compound AB and we're going to look at first only from the A perspective okay from the atom of A perspective so uh, atom A and atom B can be essentially anything because there's no limitation so uh, I can have R as small as I want which would be closer to the zero side and B as big as I want in principle, assuming that there's no periodic table, <laughs> for example. Um, I mean, because you need know, to just make these things arbitrary size, right? A meter or something, which is, of course, not true. But anyway, uh, or I could have the exact opposite. A could be huge and B could be tiny, right? No limitations because there's no restriction. And the same thing is true with coordination two. Uh, because I, if I'm bonded to two things, I can still expand out uh, in the same way. I could have little tiny a with two gigantic b's, but they never really run into each other, so there's no limitation. Or vice versa, I can have a little tiny uh, a b with uh, you know huge a's. And now you can see why, uh, with a coordination number three, things get a little more complicated. Because finally. At some point, when I expand these Bs, uh, if I had more of them, they're going to run into each other, and then we're not going to be touching uh, A anymore. And the reason we need to be touching is, remember what this represents. This represents RA and RB. So remember that this represents uh, bonding. If I draw this apart, I've got some distance greater than RA and RB, and that means that uh, R0, which you know is sitting somewhere in the middle, we're not even close to that. We're at some other energy. This isn't a solid, right? So we're looking here at this hardball hard ball model where in order to stack and fill space, A and B have to be touching each other. And um, if there's a particular shape where they can't touch, then that's a limitation for that coordination. And you can see that here. It's actually not very clear because when you look at this little trigonometry, remember this is uh, RA plus RB, and that's why that's a key distance because we know that. And then we drop a, a perpendicular line down to the side of this isosceles triangle. So these are 60 degrees, this is 30 degrees. And so that's just drawn over here by the side. Now a little bit of a mystery is all of a sudden uh, we write RB here. And this isn't RB in the current picture, right? Because there's this whole other segment that exists between here and here, right? 
So first you might be saying, oh, well, that's kind of weird. That's not RB. But it is RB in the limit, and the limit is what we're after. What happens if A shrinks such that A, I have to figure out how to draw this just right. is now these Bs are touching each other, right? So here's A, and these are Bs. Now I got a problem that if, if A shrinks further, I don't have bonding anymore. So clearly there's some minimum, right? RA over RB is, um, has to be greater than some minimum. And that minimum is calculated here because, of course, if these are touching, then indeed this side is um, uh, 2RB, which means this side's RB. And so that limit is given as RA, of, RA over RB is uh, 0.155. So it has to be uh, greater RA, which is on top. And we're talking about C and A. So we're looking from an A perspective at the coordination of how many Bs do I have around A. So this is coordination three because I have three Bs, right? And you find out with that planar arrangement, which is the way that they would uh, coordinate, uh, you have to have RA over RB equals uh, 0.155, okay? At least above that, right? You could have... Now... Uh, and so that's our first limitation. Remember, these had no limitations because the geometry didn't lend them. Of course, now we can go on to a coordination number four, which is going to be a tetrahedron because we're going to evenly space. Because remember, if these guys are all charge negative, remember our little model, A is this little positive thing, B is a negative ion. It doesn't matter how many charges right now. We're just, they're just positive and negative. And uh, the, uh, the Bs are going to be... Uh, always optimizing their distance apart. So if I go and I have a coordination of four, it's going to be a tetrahedron because that keeps, that minimizes the, uh, uh, I mean, it maximizes the distance between each B, right? If I try to go to some other shape, these guys get closer, but these guys might be further away. But on average, if I'm going to go for some sort of, uh, you know, optimization in a regular way, then these Bs are going to be uh, trying to be as far apart as possible, but they all have to be the same distance from, from A. And so that's a tetrahedron. And you can do the same calculation here. You can say, ah, you know, these guys are going to touch when, you know, this distance uh, gets close enough, right? And then in that case, when these guys come together, if A shrinks further, it won't be in touch with the Bs. And so we end up with that case now is 0.225. So you already see what's happening is that as we increase the coordination number, right, RA has to be bigger, right? So if I have, you know, a huge difference in atom size, so RA over RB is very small, it's going to be hard to create complex structures because they tend to fall into um, other kinds of um, uh, coordination, lower lower coordination, right? So um, when I get atoms that are similar in size, that allows me to go to higher coordination, right? RA, RB gets closer uh, to one. And you can see that here, because now if I go up to six, right, again, eventually we can have the same kind of criterion where when the Bs come together, and that's a two B along that segment, uh, you end up with RA over RB uh, 0.414. So now RA has to, compared to RB, has to be, you know, closer. It's got to be a lot closer to the radius of B to start to have this high coordination. And so on. Again, here, it's these distances that eventually uh, touch. Uh, so remember, remember the terminology. This is a tetrahedral polyhedron. This is a uh, uh, octagonal uh, pocket, uh, octahedral, octahedral site. Uh, 
Oh, sorry, this is octahedral site. Whoops, sorry. Octa being uh, eight. This is six. Sorry. And uh, so we have a little, um, uh, you know, a double pyramid. So this is, remember, if you think about this shape. If I drew that correctly, ah, whatever. It's a two pyramids up, touching upside down. And uh, with, with six atoms around it. And then finally, uh, you could have a coordination of 12. But for 12, look what happens. Well, anyway, let's finish with the octahedral site. The octahedral site, you can see now that there's only 0.732. you got to be getting much closer uh, to one or greater, of course. And then, uh, so, so RA can't be very small. RA to RB can't be small at all. And then with RA... Um, slash rb we have to be at one or or greater uh, so then it sort of the greater really means that it depends on what coordination uh, b has to have around it and it doesn't have to be the same if it were the same and we have a composition of a equals b then of course identically they both have to be one in order to have a coordination of 12 and we'll talk about that more complicated situation where uh, we have to think about from an a perspective and a B perspective right now but at least before we leave this page we should take away from this is that in each case the um, radius of RA compared to our you know over RB has to get greater and greater if I have higher and higher coordination that is if A wants to be connected to more and more uh, B atoms So that's all from the A perspective. Okay, we put A in here and we had B. But of course, there is another situation, which is B wants to be bonded in a particular way, and it doesn't necessarily want to be bonded in the same way as A, right? So we'll keep it completely generic for now, and we'll join them up in a second when we do composition, because obviously the thing that's going to determine uh, the ratio of the number of A atoms in the structure to the number of B atoms depends on composition, right? So, but before we get there, let's think about it from the, instead of the coordination number from only A's perspective, let's look at it from B's perspective. So I'm showing you that here, and this gets a little confusing if you don't think about it carefully. So let's think about this carefully. Now I'm looking at coordination around B, okay? And... You know, this middle column, you can just think about it's it's sort of uh, just switching labels in the sense that, well, we had C and A before, and so we had RA over RB. And therefore, um, if I just switch labels, I have, you know, NB now and RB over RA, right? Uh, but that doesn't really accomplish anything because now I've just shifted the center of the universe to B, and I still don't have them related to each other because, you know, all I'm saying, just like I did before, was that, well, um, when I, uh, for example, when I go to my coordination of three, you know, what this says is that my RB has to be greater than RA, uh, uh, RB over RA has to be greater than 0.155, otherwise B is too small and I'm not bonding anymore. So I really haven't done anything except, you know, I'm just looking at it from, from a B perspective. So what I really want to do is keep this coordination thinking for B, but I actually want to get it in terms of RA over RB so that now we have C and A and C and B in terms of the same RA over RB so you don't have to um, uh, be thinking in two different reference frames. So the way to do that is simply say, let's take this case here as an example. You know, if I had in the old case, I said RA over RB I'm just going back to the other case to make it simple. Um, actually, let's 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 use this the right way so I don't confuse you. So let's take R A over R B, and what that says is this really has to be greater than uh, 0 0.155, right? Just like we did the detailed case out before. Well, if I pay attention to my math, and I want to invert this, remember I bring this over, 
and I bring this over, and I bring that over that way, but the, the greater than sign shouldn't change, right? So what that means is that I end up with RA over RB is less than 1 over 0 0.155. And of course, if I take that inverse, that means that RA over RB uh, must be less than uh, 1 over 0.155, which is 6.45. Okay? So now you've got it from the, the coordination number of A and B related to the same RA, RB. So what we do is we put that down here. So in terms of RA over RB now, I have to be less than 6.45 in terms of this ratio. Right. So you can already see some utility here because uh, if I'm looking at C and A and I'm looking at RA over RB also from that perspective, I know that um, if I have a compound where I want the coordinations to be the same, so for every uh, um, and let's suppose that, that that coordination is 3. So each A has to be bonded to 3 Bs, and each B has to be bonded to 3A. Well, now I can think about that because, aha, from a C and A point of view, if we go back and think about that, RA over RB, remember, needs to be greater than 0 0.155. Right? Now, if I look at C and B in terms of R of R B, I come over here and I see ah, R A over R B to have the same coordination number of three. Um, it's got to be less than zero point. Uh, sorry, than six point four five. So if you look at these two, it says that, ah, now you can see the beauty of writing everything in terms of RA over RB. It tells me that RA, of, RA over RB has to be between 0.155 and 6.45 uh, for a crystal structure where I'm demanding a coordination number of three uh, in each of these cases. Okay. So we'll stop there. That's kind of laying out the groundwork for the first part of understanding Pauling's uh, first rule. We've covered coordination number. We've covered the radius ratios. But we'll keep on going in the, in the next lecture showing now how we can use these rules to create uh, estimated um, coordination and therefore space groups for uh, the you know, the type of space groups that would be compatible with uh, particular uh, atoms.